Okay, let's get started. Uh, I'm Fred Murphy. I work with the Marxist Education Project, and we're very happy to present the second uh, section of a set of presentations by the Yale Working Group on Globalization and Culture uh, around the general theme of the fallout of war. Uh, today's uh, topic is metonyms of militarism, and we have a panel of presentations that will be presented in more detail to you by Monique Flores Ulysses, and I will turn the floor over to Monique. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for our session today. We are the Working Group on Globalization and Culture, an interdisciplinary cultural studies laboratory made up of faculty, graduate students, and postdoctoral scholars that has been practicing collective research at Yale University since 2003. Our methods are a bit unorthodox. Together, we work to select a keyword for the academic year that connects our thinking across time periods, regions, practices, and knowledges. This keyword reflects shared commitments and concerns across the group. Some of us will make arguments about the potency and the shortcomings of the keyword. Others will integrate the keyword into pre-existing genealogies or individual research agendas. We are pleased to return virtually to the Marxist Education Project, where we presented state forms and forming states last year, resources and relations the previous year, and use a user's manual four years ago. This year, we have looked at the fallout of war. Most of us have come of age in an era that proclaimed both the end of the Cold War and the onset of endless war, forever war, infinite war, global war, galactic war, wars unbounded by time or space. So we seek to explore the way war has marked bodies and minds, landscapes and languages, the mundane militarisms of everyday lives and places. War, what is it and what is it good for? War might seem like a foregone conclusion or a state of exception. In either case, it is an archetype of crisis. Trade wars can become militarized and hot wars can look cold, depending on your vantage point. The race war, Twitter tells us, is impending. But in an age of US forever wars, understanding war as punctuating the flow of history seems to be entirely insufficient. War is, some argue, a way of life, a structuring condition that shapes our examinations of the history of the present. The war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on COVID, the war on Christmas. War is also a ubiquitous metaphor, a self-righteous idiom that announces moral panic and articulates racial logic in otherwise terms. But metaphors of war have also influenced various radical traditions and social movements, including anti-war activism and Gramsci's deployment of metaphors of war and his theorizing of hegemony. Taking account of war as constitutive of the present, the working group explores war's meanings as event, analytic, and metonym. The project is divided into two halves. In the first of our two panels last week, Chronologies of Conflict, we moved from the afterlives of the US Civil War and the internment camps of the Second World War to the labors of making war, mid-century African-American poetry, and sitcoms during the global war on terror. Today, in our second panel, Metonyms of Militarism, we follow the diffuse wars of nuclear, nuclear fallout in the Pacific to the submerged wars that surface around tourism in South Korea to counter-revolution in Mexico, bridging cultural resistance in 60s Palestine with the present day US culture war. We have 10 current members. Five of us will present the second half of our project today. The other five presented last week. Each of us will talk for about 15 minutes. Finally, as this is a single collective presentation, we ask that you save your responses for the end. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us on Zoom on this sunny, beautiful Saturday. Um, and just, ag again, another happy birthday to Monique, who I feel like, and congratulations to Michael, whose grandson was born yesterday. <laughs> Lots of celebrations ongoing. Um, uh, so I'll start us off. On a sunny day in May, much like today, I headed to Ka'u Rural Health Clinic on the big island of Hawaii. I was bringing cartons of water and snacks to a pop-up COVID vaccine clinic in Ocean View, a community not far from the clinic. Next slide, please. Around 700 Marshallese live in Ocean View, 
Following World War II, the United States initiated military rule in the Marshall Islands and other islands in Micronesia under what was then known as the Trust Territory of the Pacific Islands. From 1946 to 1958, the U.S. detonated 67 nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands, displaying, displacing many Marshallese to Hawaii. Next slide, please. An archipelago that it itself has withstood centuries of U.S. colonialism and continues to be under U.S. military occupation. The U.S. maintains a neocolonial relationship with Micronesia under the Compact of Free Association, or COFA. Uh, and this map here just uh, in red is the specific um, community of ocean view that I'll be talking about and from which a lot of the um, interlocutors I am speaking about in my presentation are from. Uh, as well as a community in Kona, which is just a little north of Ocean View. Next slide, please. The Compact of Free Association, or COFA, enshrined permanent U.S. military occupation of Micronesia, offered paltry sums to victims of nuclear destruction, and allows COFA migrants to live in the U.S. without a visa for indefinite periods of time. In my larger project, I see COFA as a continuation of what I call nuclear colonialism, which apprehends how scientists, anthropologists, and military strategists created disciplinary knowledge and propelled for future U.S. military and diplomatic strategy by transforming the Marshall Islands into a proving ground for their own research concerns. Some of these strategies resurface in the ongoing Korean War and the Korean state's tourism fix, as Madeline's presentation will show us. Nuclear colonialism has a long-reaching legacy that includes irradiated lands, radiation sicknesses, cancers, and forced displacements, including to Ocean View. Next slide, please. We set up our clinic in a church owned by Jonathan Jackson, a community leader who had offered us the space. I was organizing goodie bags when I caught his eye and asked if we would be able to chat. We grabbed a couple of folding chairs from inside the church and brought them outside, adjacent to a workshop where Jonathan would fix cars for members of the community. Since Jonathan's arrival in Hawaii three decades ago, the community had buried 30 to 40 of their deceased at the cemetery in Na'alehu, the town nearest to Ocean View. Jonathan's mother lived with him in, in Hawaii, but she wanted to be buried in the Marshall Islands. She requested that he do the same. He laughed, sharing that he told his wife, I have an idea. If I die, you burn me, you cremate me, and then 50-50, half to the cemetery and half to my mother. He paused and then gestured to his stomach, from here to up, my mom. I laughed, asking if this meant that Hawaii got his bottom half. Jonathan spent the better part of his life helping transform Ocean View into a place Marshallese could live. His remark on scattering his ashes between two islands reflects the unevenness of belonging that displacement creates. The metaphor of scattered ashes is not hidden meaning. It is meaning itself in that it reveals the complicated sets of relationships between lands and pasts that have supposedly been severed. Using scattered ashes as a guiding visual, this portion of our presentation traces the material residues of nuclear colonialism in the life course. I consider how fallout and war have atomized across the lives of my interlocutors, rather than just accruing at either end as reproductive injustice or bodily collapse. Nuclear colonialism's rhetorical strategies rely on necroteleological narratives that fix time and space. Bombs, war, and Pacific Islanders are in the past and out of sight. The narratives themselves become self-evident. They are beside the point. My interlocutors offer a poetics that is the point. They narrativize nuclear colonialism's accumulation across space and time, arguing that illness produced from radiation exposure is not the only kind of nuclear colonial violence they face. They register an accumulative violence rather than one that is merely slow to account for the multiplicity of atomic afterlives that do not unfold from a single source. Instead, these multiple temporalities and spatialities scatter. Nuclear colonialism is not a single singular unfolding, but a series of contingencies. Next slide, please. I met Lilo at her home on Kona side, where she waved for me to sit on a couch next to her mother, uh, Boo Boo. Boo Boo contracted thyroid cancer because of radiation exposure, and she comes to Kona for her annual checkups. Lilo explained her community's situation. Next slide, please. Sharing, 
you know, we didn't come here because we wanted to, but because of the fallout, they had to, because now they have all these sicknesses that they're not used to. Now they have all these things that are different in their way of life. It wasn't something that we planned out and purposely said, oh, let's go to Hawaii or Arkansas. If it wasn't for that fallout, they would have been perfectly fine. Before the fallout, live long. Maybe there was like childbirth complications, but they lived long and well. Like you, they were perfectly fine. After that stuff and taking away the breadfruit and fish and give us spam and corned beef and rice, and it's like now all these sickness. Lilo's words linked fallout to the U.S. military's displacement of the Marshallese to non-arable land, which then required them to rely on U.S. imports for food. Many of these imports were wartime rations, tins of spam, and bags of rice. Her words also demonstrate the desperation that catalyzed Marshallese migrations across the Pacific and to the continent. Lilo offers a multiscalar reading of displacement, the ways that it moves body, community, and land out of joint. Next slide, please. Lilo remembered how her auntie Darlene would talk about interviewing ladies back home after the fallout about giving birth to babies that were like not even human. I've seen people with six toes, six fingers, or like half their body is discolored. And now I understand why they were the way they were. It wasn't just the birth defect, it was caused. Her emphasis on the intentionality of the bombings was specific as the US still disavows its culpability in radiation-borne illnesses. This disavowal is also spatial. Of all the Marshall Islands, only four atolls are recognized by the US as having experienced fallout. Anuetok, Rongelab, Utrecht, and Bikini, despite the fact that fallout impacted the entire archipelago, and as recent studies have shown, the entire world. Next slide, please. Lilo mentioned a friend from Wake Island who had seen ashes land there and later contracted cancer, explaining that this meant the fallout must have covered all of the Marshall Islands. Wake Island, or Anenkio, was not settled by Marshallese, but it is a part of Marshallese oral narratives that go back generations. It was taken over by the U.S. military in 1899 because it was uninhabited, so to speak. Its peopling by U.S. occupation and its mattering with nuclear fallout are two palimpsests of nuclear colonialism rather than separate and disconnected historical events. Next slide, please. Lilo's narrative is also multi-temporal, connecting the persistence of radiation to the continued U.S. military occupation of Kwajalein, which I, is circled here, and the destructive potential of missile tests conducted from the 1970s during Reagan's Star Wars program to the present under the banner of national security. Wake Island, also a prominent U.S. military base, is doubly hailed as a site where nuclear colonialism is made manifest. Lilo remembers that when she first arrived at her housing complex, there was just one other Marshallese family, but now she estimated that at least half of the people who lived around her were Marshallese. As a part of its various outreach efforts, the Department of Education gave her complex of supplies to plant food, such as breadfruit or banana. She pointed to, to the grassy median outside the housing complex. Quote, if you guys would have come a year ago, it was all breadfruit and banana. The new management didn't want all of that. So they cut down the breadfruit, started poisoning them, end quote. I looked at her in bewilderment and asked if they'd poisoned healthy trees. My disbelief couched in the knowledge that settler cruelty could and did look like this. She nodded, quote, yeah, healthy, like we were eating from them too, end quote. The complex itself structurally limited access to green, much less arable space. On top of this, the heavy irony in the intentional poisoning of land that Lilo and other Marshallese cultivated and ate from was not lost on anyone. Hawaii's ongoing occupation produces the conditions of possibility for this kind of accumulative violence. Land and ocean view is cheap because the ground is made of recently hardened lava flow that cannot be farmed and is downwind of volcanic pollution. Bikinians displaced to Kili Island in the Marshalls and downtown Hilo on the big island of Hawaii are experiencing climate change induced flooding that increases soil salinity and drowns crops. Another big island Marshallese community lives in Papaiko, just north of Hilo on the eastern side. In 1973, the Atomic Energy Commission tested Papaiko's soil for plutonium contamination from nuclear testing. Because of its proximity to the test sites and due to its high yearly precipitation rates, it was found to have the highest concentration of plutonium in its soil in the world. Hawaii settler colonization and ecological devastation stretches back even farther, 
with the rise of monocrop sugar plantations in the wake of the U.S. Civil War and the collapse of the slave labor plantation economy in the U.S. South, a fallout of war that Demonpreet's presentation last week provides global context for. A new monocrop in militarized Hawaii is coffee, which many Marshallese end up picking for little to no pay. Their necro, necro labor in dialectical relation to the trans-Pacific necro-capitalism set in motion by the Cold War, as Michael theorized in last week's presentation as well. Next slide, please. As Bubu's regular checkups for thyroid issues allude to, healthcare remains the most frequently cited reason for Micronesian migration to Hawaii, followed closely by education. My friend Rennie spoke with me about the experiences of being in the federal and state healthcare systems as a patient. Sometimes it's easy to get healthcare, sometimes it takes a while, but there are certain times it hasn't worked out because if there's certain types of documents they need and if we lose documents or stuff like that, but let me ask, is it right that they need these documents? Do we have to be under the US territory? Are we really their children, their baby? Am I right to feel like that? Rennie felt the perverse paternalism of the United States in her interactions with the healthcare system, how not having bureaucratic knowledge marked her as infantile in the eyes of the state. Her words carry a deeper weight in their friction with the logic of documentation and the necessity of a US, the necessity of a US relationship with the Marshall Islands. She asks if she must be their baby if there is any other relationship possible. This rhetorical gesture unsettles the way the US naturalizes COFA, the compact, through documentation and makes us question the role of the document in producing legitimacy. Rennie's words negate the performances of gratitude that Marshallese are expected to make and cancel the seemingly unpay unpayable debts the US imposed on COFA migrants by virtue of allowing them into the country. Next slide, please. Alongside healthcare, schools have also been a primary site of racialized unbelonging for Marshallese. In 2012, a fight broke out on the Kona side of the Big Island at Keala Kehehai. The fight was a result of escalating racial tensions between Micronesian and Hawaiian students. The incident led the school to shut down for two days and helped spur the creation of BIMCA, the Big Island Marshallese Community Association. In the years since, BIMCA had tr has tried to organize gatherings and publicize resources for the Marshallese community. Even so, the issue of anti-Micronesian racism in Hawaii's public school system has not dissipated. Kathy Jo remembered intervening on behalf of her daughter, who was a student at Keala Kehe Elementary, which is in the same district as Keala Kehehai. Five years after the upper school fight, Kathy Jo went to pick up her daughter, who along with the other Marshallese students in her class was being sent home for lice. Kathy Jo found out these searches happened every Monday, but only for Marshallese students. She questioned why only Marshallese children were being selected for lice searches. Her vocal complaint resulted in an altercation in the hallway where a teacher accused Kathy Jo of scratching her and later called the police to Kathy Jo's home, which is an ocean view. One of the women in our group leaned over and asked Kathy Jo, so did the cop get you? Kathy Jo shook her head, but she resolutely replied, I'm not going there just to fight. I'm going to fight for my right. They know we're not strong like them. That's why they do this. Kathy Jo's story demonstrates the deep entanglements between the car carceral state and Micronesian precarity. Marshallese children were singled out to have their hair inspected for lice. And Kathy's jo Kathy Jo's daughter understood this as a racializing process that would leave her without friends in the class. In a quiet lo loyalty, she actually placed lice from a friend's hair into her own, knowing that she would be checked and thus affirming the school's racism. The teacher sounded an alarm to which numerous institutional agents rushed forward to answer, including the cop she had deputized to go look for Kathy Jo on the mere possibility that she had touched this teacher. As Kathy Jo explained, and as her words resonate with the other conflicts that have emerged in the school setting for Micronesian students themselves, these fights aren't just to fight. They're fights for the right to exist amidst bureaucratic structures that not only lack the appropriate resources for this migrant group, but also act actively antagonize those that seek state services. Next slide, please. From birth to burial, nuclear colonialism's accumulative violences are felt in multiple temporalities and scales and across the life course. The experiences of Marshallese and diaspora shape and ground these diffuse violences, and they offer other routes out of nuclear colonialism's totalizing hold on narrative itself. As Jonathan and I were finishing our conversation, he gestured to the hardened lava flow that surrounded us, the land that made up the bedrock of the Ocean View community. Quote, 
Marshley's community came to Big Island from our island and so many things change and so many good things grow up. When I go back to the Marshall Islands, walk to the beach on my island and look to Big Island, I will say, yes, it is that way. Let them stay there, let them do what they do, and let me rest in peace on the beach. I'll sit down and look around the sky, the wind, the trees, the birds, and then what? The end. Where is the sky? Oh, he went to the Big Island. Where is he now? Oh, he's in the Marshall Islands with his mother. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Continuing with the threads of subjugated memories and alternative itineraries of war and its aftermaths is Madeline Hahn. Hello. Um, so my presentation today is titled Remapping the Miracle on the Han and uh, moves us into Seoul, South Korea. Next slide, please. A boggle of tourists stands on the shores of the Han River, waiting to board a ferry, departing for a nighttime tour of the waterfront. It is March, the air in Seoul is brisk. A few in line watch other ferries cruise by, leaving trails on the water. Others cast their sights on the skyline, punctuated by the bright lights of overtime office work and one-bedroom apartments. While the Han River is one of South Korea's most popular tourist sites, the members of this group were recruited by Minuk Lim, or Im Minuk, a Seoul-based artist who choreographed the river tour as a performance work, which she then recorded into the video piece titled SOS Adoptive Dissensus that uh, is screenshotted on the presentation. The air fills with the whirring of helicopters as guests file into the ship's belly in search of seats. A voice scratches over the intercom, introducing himself as Captain Kim Jae-il. The tour boat starts to glide down the river, shepherding passengers past a sequence of seemingly spontaneous scenes along the riverbank. A march of protesters porting flashing mirrors, a dance of two lovers sashaying the length of Nodul Island, which is an abandoned artificial landmass of the Japanese colonial period on the river. And finally, a conversation with a former political prisoner of conscience departing for his nightly commute. Next slide, please. Captain Gim, who remains unseen for the duration of the sail, begins the tour with a disclaimer, quote, the Han River is considered to be the lifeblood of our people, but today's sightseeing tour will be a bit different than usual. I don't mean to promote the government or a company, I've always thought of myself as working for the Han River itself, end quote. Next slide, please. The captain's reference to tours promoted by the government or a company speaks to the state-sponsored status of the Han River as a site of commodified leisure. In 2007, conservative Seoul Mayor Oh Se-un announced the inauguration of the Hangang Renaissance Project, a multi-million dollar master plan consisting of 33 subplans targeting the transformation of the riverfront into a world-renowned green belt. And efforts to, quote, rebirth Seoul as a, quote, green city, end quote, city planners advocated for the construction of 12 riverside ecological parks, the replacement of concrete revetments with natural riverbanks, and the amplification of conservation efforts targeting migratory birds and their habitats. In an official report, the Metropolitan Government announced that, quote, the Hangang, which means Han River, itself is Korea's history and life. In the present as well as the past, Koreans have lived with the gently flowing Hangang at the heart of their lives. The Hangang Renaissance is a new chapter in the long history of this river and will create a new brand of Seoul as a world-class green city by discovering the river's potential values and infinite possibilities, end quote. Next slide, please. The present day popularity of the Han River as a tourist destination mirrors the river's importance in popular narratives of South Korea's economic development, often referred to as the miracle on the Han, which operates as a metaphor for the rapidity of the nation's post-war industrialization. A former Japanese colony following the 1953 armistice that resulted in a ceasefire, but not an end to the Korean War, South Korea underwent a series of aggressive economic reforms, most notably under dictator Park Chung-hee. 
During last Saturday's presentations, Michael spoke of the co-constitution of militarism and capitalism, a relation that is deeply true and felt uh, in post-war South Korea. Having seized presidential power in 1961 by staging a military coup, Park implemented a slew of five-year economic plans that turbocharged South Korea's economy by developing its heavy industry sector, mobilizing foreign aid facilitated by the United States, loosening trade protections for Korean merchants and farmers, and most controversially, by normalizing relations with Japan. As historians and interdisciplinary scholars of modern Korea have pointed out, the hallmark developmentalism of the authoritarian governments of Pak and his successors depended heavily on the anti-communist militarization of the post-war state. Economic development took on the tenor of anti-communism as a residue of the war, as Pak claimed that the, quote, victory in the war against communism, end quote, was equivalent to victory in a fierce economic war, of which the Han River became the stage. Next slide, please. Transnational capitalism, um, as scholars of post-war Asia and of the Pacific have pointed out, um, and as Lucero actually addressed in her presentation on Japanese migration to Mexico last weekend, operates both as a mode of production and as a mnemonic structure, which, quote, not only licenses a diversity of memories that cannot be readily subsumed into national narratives, but also threatens to replace them with a newly strengthened and unidimensional regime of temporality that has as its single telos the victory of capitalism, end quote. Uh, and that's from a uh, anthology called Perilous Memories. Um, Anshul's presentation um, immediately prior to mine encapsulates how memory itself is matter. Indeed, capitalism's unidimensional regime is not only temporal, but also spatial, beginning with the corralling of the Han River through techniques of so-called rational river management implemented during the Japanese colonial period that transformed understandings of the river from a waterway to a water resource. Though the Han historically served as an important social and economic lifeline, integral to the lifeways of Korean merchants, farmers, and their families, Pak's presidency and his successor, Chun Doo Won, would recapitulate approaches to river management that elided the local significances of the river, transforming the water into a stage for large scale infrastructural development, into a dumping site for compounding waste, and into a dredging source for quick construction materials. The irreversible environmental consequences of these sweeping measures constitute the backdrop, as scholars like Semio and Bridget Martin have also demonstrated of the ongoing trend of reverse development, a term connoting the contemporary urban planning efforts I mentioned earlier to greenwash the riverfront in the name of environmental conservation. Next slide, please. Tourism is an ideal vehicle in some ways for narrow devising the transformation of the nation's landscape from post-war ruin to revived green space, given that it is South Korea's rapid industrialization that fueled its transformation into a desirable uh, global tourist destination. Tourism relies on the creation of spectacle, think national monuments and scenic views, while also relying on selective encounters to provide snapshots of life as it is supposedly lived by local residents, inviting tourists to immerse themselves in condensed, commodified versions of entire lifeways and ecosystems. In other words, tourism functions to orient the tourist in a so-called foreign landscape. Yet, Minuk Lim's SOS Adoptive Dissensus challenges the objectives of tourism by refusing the orienting function, in this case, of the boat tour. SOS Adoptive Dissensus consists of a series of abstract encounters performed by actors whom Lim, the artist herself, choreographed for the piece. In the tour's opening scene, the ferry drifts by protesters pictured on the presentation um, standing on the riverbank who are holding up mirrors that reflect the boat's lights, thereby interfering with the passenger's sense of sight and visibility. Next slide, please. In another scene, the boat beams a spotlight on two people ecstatically professing their love for one another on an artificial island in the river, all while bemoaning the fact that the secret meeting spot will soon be developed into an opera house. Gesturing to his girlfriend, one of the lovers orates from the shore to the passengers on the boat, uh, quote, we come to this island when it gets dark, 
We can only meet when it's dark. That's the only time I can touch her face. But soon I won't be able to do this anymore. There won't be any place where it is dark, any place where we can hide, end quote. Rather than showcasing the beauty of the surrounding metropolis or romancing passengers with views of the city's attractions, SOS adoptive dissensus eschews legibility. As Crystal Munebeck has written of artist Lim's other work, the nighttime performances in SOS adoptive dissensus play on the ferry passenger's uh, sense of visibility, challenging the predominance of visuality as a mode of navigation and knowing, and reckons with the limitations of visual representation. Next slide. At one point, the ferry passes Pum's home or Chestnut Island, where in 1968, then Seoul Mayor Kim hyun pressed a button that detonated a dynamite charge on the landmass to produce rubble for building the satellite district of Yoido in Seoul. Today, Yoido is known as Seoul's main finance and investment district. And what is left of Pamsom, on the other hand, now exists as a designated conservation area for migratory birds. Next slide. Although the Seoul Metropolitan website refers to Pamsom as, quote, an island abandoned by people, end quote, at the time of its detonation, Pamsom was home to 62 households who had lived on the island for more than 17 generations. A reporter for the Korea Times wrote of Pamsom in 1986, as pictured on the screen, quote, in this forgotten part of Seoul, the forgotten people have been leading their own peculiar life, which rather resembled the patterns of Korean life centuries ago. Surrounded by the level sand and the river, the islet has no electricity, no water service system, no school, no hospital, no recreation facilities, and no feeds. Not many outside people know about the place. They only know the inhabitants kept being evacuated to somewhere where the river was swollen by rain in the summers, and some knew they could have the best roasted eels there, end quote. The article, titled, quote, For Projected City, Island Faded to Vanish, end quote, describes Pamsom's social ecosystem through a series of negations, one with no electricity, no water service system, no school, no hospital, characterizing the island's residents as out of joint with modernity. As the past and present of Pamsom are constituted as beholden or faded to the imagined future of the projected city, the spatial annihilation of Pamsom serves to fulfill the temporal speculative mandate of capitalist development that is consecrated as Yoido. Next slide. While Lim does not explicitly mention this history in her work, Pamsom features in Lim's boat tour when Captain Kim cuts the ferry's lights while passing Pamsom so as to protect the ecosystem of Chestnut Island, suspending the passengers in darkness. He begins to speak over the boat's intercom, quote, there are mysterious creatures moving around in the dark. People are often afraid of the dark, but darkness can help you see more carefully. Whenever I pass this place, I always keep my eyes open. Then I have dreams and my imagination wanders. I close my mouth and open my ears, end quote. I suggest that the alternate orientation to space suggested in Captain Keem's quote offers tourists a blueprint for engaging with space beyond the quick exchange of tourism. The captain's invocation of listening, I close my mouth and open my ears, as a metaphorical and material mode of navigation subverts the notion of a tourist as the protagonist, positioning them instead as a potentially critical listener of the landscape. Next slide. What exactly this might mean becomes clear in the tourist concluding scene, which features Kang Yong Ju, South Korea's youngest long-term political prisoner, with whom Lim collaborated for the piece. Standing in the shadows of the riverbank, Kang begins to flash the headlights of his car at the boat in a standardized sequence that soon becomes recognizable as Morse code. The tour's announcer calls out to Kang, quote, are you trying to send an SOS signal with those lights, end quote? As the headlights continue to flare and fade into the darkness, Kong replies by addressing the boat's passengers, quote, I am sending an SOS for all those people who say no to government authority, the conscientious objectors to military service, the fingerprinting objectors, the converted objectors. Deet, 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 da, 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 deet, 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 which is the Morse code for SOS. <laughs> 
Even among you, there must be people who object to being right-handed or people who are anti-marriage. Haven't you ever objected to something, even if it's a trivial matter? Farewell, everyone. Perhaps we will meet again, again someday when you say no to something. Take care, end quote. And next, Mara will address the continuing imbrication of culture and war by turning to the long legacies and traditions of Palestinian revolutionary poetry. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us today. Today, uh, I will be talking about the poetry of the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish and the 1967 war. The title of my presentation is taken from one of the many interviews that I'll be drawing on today. Next slide, please. In the late 60s, following the 1967 October war, the Palestinian intellectual and poet Mahmoud Darwish began to rethink mediation, how he had attempted to render thinkable the systemic conditions of Palestinian social life in his first collections of poetry. Liam Darwish had gained fame throughout the decade as the leading figure of a movement known as Shi'at al-Muqawama, a resistance poetry, which emerged and occupied Palestine as part of a broader set of practices of cultural resistance against the new Israeli state. Inspired by decolonization movements across the world, Darwish placed his verse in a metonymic relation to the voice of the people, articulated as Salta Shab or Lugat al-Nas in Arabic relying on a stylistic amalgam of operations at the level of diction, syntax, and imagery, meant to prioritize simplicity and immediacy. His poetry was understood as a form of incitement, or tahrid. In the eyes of the Palestinian public, it communicated the realities of oppression and anger with such clarity that it doubled as a weapon alongside the gun, the pamphlet, and the diplomatic delegation. Next slide, please. Take that which is poem we lack, Loyalty, published in 64, uh, his 64 collection, Awrat al Zaytun, Olive Leaves, which begins with the line, I carried your voice in my heart and veins, so don't worry if I lose my battle. Addressing a you who is both land and lover, that we share reinforces a trope that will become synonymous with this early work. The poetic speaker positions himself as a translator who immediately captures the voice of Palestine and transforms it into poetic language. I fed the wind my verses and its flourishes so that my rhymes became swords of fire. I believed in the letter, Amantu bil harf, either dead or absent and absent or erecting a noose for my enemy. I believed in the letter, a fire that doesn't go out if I turn into ash or my tyrant does. So if I fall and cannot raise my flag, the people, a nas, will write on my grave. He did not perish. Rhymes as swords of fire, the letter as a noose. These homologies, whose revolutionary romanticism saturated the third world as poetry of the period, shaped Darwish's reputation as a writer of militant verse. Following the pan-Arab defeat at the hands of Israel in June 1967, the loss of the territories of Golan Heights, the West Bank, Sinai, and the Gaza Strip. However, Darwish found himself scrutinizing that quality of the immediacy attributed to his weaponized verse and taking a marked step away from it. Akhir al-Layl, The End of the Night, his first collection published after the war, withdrew its reliance on direct expression and replaced it with symbolically thickened language thereby complicating the representational relationship between poetic speaker and the voice of the people. His public did not hide its dissatisfaction. In a 1968 interview with the Lebanese Communist magazine, that we should hear some of the most common complaints he received following the book's publication. Quote, this poetry is incomprehensible, khayr mafhum. Will every reader have to come ask the poet to explain this or that symbol? or consult an astrologer. He defended himself with conviction, expressing his unrelenting preoccupation with the relationship between his poetry and the people. After all, he considered himself a revolutionary poet addressing the masses. But just as the conditions for evolution in Palestine had changed, so had the role of the poet. The relationship between reality and poetic language 
needed to be questioned accordingly. Next slide, please. And I quote, do I need to return to direct expression in order for the interaction between my poetry and the people not be interrupted? How do I reconcile on the one hand, ensuring that the word can influence the masses as a revolutionary word with the demands of the word's modern aesthetic conditions? End quote. There are as many answers in the form of literary movements, poetic schools, and heated polemics to the question of how and even if poetic language mediates social reality as there are attempts to resolve the problem of what language is. Is the term poetic realism oxymoronic? Should it be? Is poetic language pure textuality? Is it inherently apolitical? Commitment and autonomy are the two poles between which some of these questions have bounced. Political poetry, generalizing here, has historically hitched its wagon to the project of mediation and even realism with all of the complications that these terms imply. One could go even further and say, as I will, that the predicament of the committed poet in times of revolution, war, or war distended into the everyday violence of settler colonialism is in different ways, but always, inextricably bound up with, quote, the complex social activity of representation, as a tradition of Marxist scholarship has defined mediation. Here is another. To mediate is to make present, to clothe the abstract systemic conditions of social life in images and bits of language, mediums, that establish presence in the face of institutional forces invested in its denial. To give presence to Palestinian reality, to the forms of life that settler colonialism seeks to eradicate, this was Darwish's primary and unerring concern. The value of his interventions lie precisely in how they illuminate not only the complications of poetic form, genre, and style when it comes to revolutionary writing, but also how the representational activity enacted by poetry has been understood, contested, and ultimately determined by cycles of war and less spectacular forms of violence like settler colonialism. Darwish's career anchors us in historical specificity and the articulations of a poet struggling to maintain an active dialectical relationship between his poetry and an ongoing struggle defined by shifting strategic demands, modes of confrontation, and political objectives. In the time that I have left today, I'd like to reflect on how the Pan-Arab defeat in June 1967 led Darwish to elaborate what we could call a critique of immediacy. Even as the defeat complicated the idea of poetry as the literary equivalent of armed struggle, it radicalized Darwish's vision of the symbol as a repository of the absent homeland, as a form of presence and an essential communicative tool in the struggle for decolonization. Next slide, please. The 1967 war, also known as the Six Day War, the June War, or in Arabic, Naqsa, the setback, that's a typo, it's not the catastrophe, that's the Naqba, has played a forceful role in periodizing modern Arab intellectual production. The defeat, quote, was a political and intellectual crisis that called for a reassessment and a revisiting of the modes of thinking that had prevailed, as well as of the political and intellectual struggles that had hitherto been adopted, writes the scholar Elizabeth Kazab. In the realm of the literary, the rise of novelistic genres associated with postmodernism, for example, and the renewed interest in prose poetry have been tied to an emergent disillusionment with the language of secular nationalism, a widely felt crisis of writing, and the radicalization of critique. In the context of Palestinian politics, the post-67 period was marked by the polarization of two major strategies, cultural resistance and armed struggle. Slide, please. Indeed, an unfortunate irony can be said to have hastened the ideological disarticulation of cultural activity and anti-colonial struggle in the aftermath of the war. The scholar Mahanasar reminds us that as Palestinian militant groups like the PLO and Fatah intensified their guerrilla style attacks against Israel, they drew on the writings of third world figures like Franz Fanon and Che Guevara, not only to enhance their tactics, but also to question 
whether the Palestinian resistance poets were truly engaged in resistance. In other words, to question the homology, alive and effective in consciousness raising efforts throughout the first decades of Israeli occupation between the word and the gun. The irony, it is worth stressing, is that there would have been no Palestinian resistance poetry were it not for the examples of the Algerian and the Cuban revolution, their intellectual leaders, and their conceptions of language, social and constitutive, meaning active in the social construction of reality. While locating Darwish's critique of immediacy then as part of a self-critical turn in Arab thought that took the very concept of resistance or muqawama as an object of scrutiny, we should not confuse his post-67 poetry with a mea culpa. His critique, I want to suggest, was not meant to break with the impulse to communicate or make present the conditions of Palestinian life, past and present, but rather his turn to Arams, the symbol, and Humud, a concept which I will define in a second, should instead be understood as new ways of making the social thinkable and the project of social transformation possible. Slide, please. Scholars of Arabic poetics have defined Humud, which more plainly means obscurity, or the sort of list of, of definitions you see here, as a, quote, density of syntax and imagery that leads to misunderstanding and misinterpretation, but also poetic newness, end quote. Traditionally seen as the purview of the Arab modernists, Humud was indicted by many committed poets as a form of mystification. So that we should self shied away from monolithic accounts of Humud, his defiant embrace of it after the 67 war does represent an evolution in his poetic theory. The defense of this new poetry became tied to the defense of the political value of Humud. Asked repeatedly to justify himself following the publication of The End of the Night, he offered lucid explanations of how symbolism and Humud could serve as tools of resistance in a context of cultural siege. Next slide, please. We need to distinguish between two modes that we asserted in an interview in 1970 a type of humud that resembles the relationship between the sun and the earth, and a type of humud that results from the sun bidding farewell to the earth, which is what characterizes the modernist poets who professionalize in humud. Next slide, please. In his theses on the concept of history, the German Marxist philosopher Walter Benjamin drew on the same cosmic relationship to construct a different analogy. Quote, as flowers turn towards the sun, by dint of a secret heliotropism, the past strives to turn to that sun which is rising in the sky of history, end quote. Darwish, too, seems to be thinking about Humud as a sort of secret heliotropism through which the fleeting appearance of the past can be captured in the present. Symbols and images can do the work, Darwish is telling us, of seizing the past as it flashes up, to use Benjamin's term, in the present of rendering it meaningful in the present. It is appropriate then that flowers and fruits, oranges, olives, and roses gain new significance as symbols in Darwish's poetry after 67. These are symbols, he asserts, that contain and are animated by the totality of social relationships that make up Palestinian reality. Darwish puts it as follows. The farmer who planted an olive tree in the hopes of reproducing himself is met with one of three fates. He's either killed at the tree, forced to emigrate away from it, or allowed to remain close but cut off from it, unable to maintain a relationship with his tree. In all three cases, nothing remains of the tree except its meanings. That is, reality itself has turned into a symbol symbol that asserts a present relationship to the land where that relationship is no longer. Lest we get bogged down in abstractions, I would like to end my talk today by taking a quick look at a poem from The End of the Night, the collection that prompted all of these reflections. Slide, please. The Rose in the Dictionary, Al-Ward al-Qamus, is a deceptive poem. At first glance, 
and resembles earlier poems like loyalty and the simplicity of its diction and programmatic tone. But it uses these features of direct expression to make an explicit call for a new poetry and to avow the materialist relationship between symbolic language and Palestinian social reality. It is a manifesto in my eyes about mediation. For the sake of time, I'll begin reading towards the end of the poem, and this time I'll read a bit of the Arabic first before turning to the English. Waliyakum, la budda li an arfud al maut, wa in kana tasatiri tamut. Inna ni abhat fi lin qad an dugha, wa an shir jadid. Aywa, hal adraktu qabl al yom, na al harf al qamus ya habbi walib. Kifa tahya adai al kalimat, kifa tanmu. كيف تقر؟ نحن مسلنا نقضي حد مع ذكريات واستعارات وسكر وليكن لابد لي أن أرفض الورد الذي يأتي من القاموس أو ديوان شعر ينبط الورد على صعد فلاح وفي كذا عامل ينبط الورد على جرح مقاتل وعلى جبهة ساخرة. So be it. I must reject death, even if my legends die. I am searching in the rubble for light, for new poetry. Oh, did I realize before today that the letters in the dictionary, my love, are dull? How do, how do all of these words live? How do they grow? How do they mature? We still nourish them with the tears of memory, with metaphors and sugar. So be it. I must reject the rose that grows from a dictionary or a volume of poetry. Roses sprout from a peasant's arm, a worker's fist. Roses sprout on a warrior's wound on the forehead of a rock. Written in the first person in the present tense, unlike loyalty, where the representational task of the poet is given as an accomplished feat, the speaker here finds himself in a moment of self-critique and negotiation. The scene places us among ruins and rubble, in the aftermath of a battle that has prompted a profound revelation. The language of dictionaries and poetry's past is disconnected from social life. It turns to no sun, no history. The symbol, the rose, crafted out of this language has bid farewell to the earth. But the rose that encodes and mediates an entire cycle of relation and dispossession, making present and absent connection to the land, this symbol, is a form of resistance. A rose sprouts from the arm of a peasant and it turns by dint of a secret heliotropism toward the sun. Thank you. And now I pass it on to Javier who will trace the cycles of war and counter-revolution that make up modern Mexican history. Thank you, Maru. Um, so from, from the counter-revolution of the planter class in the U.S. South, as Daman Preet uh, talked about last week, to the counter-revolutions during Latin America's long Cold War, to the counter-revolution in the form of culture wars, as Saloni will present next, the centrality of counter-revolution in negating popular revolutionary demands and reformulating capitalist social relations is evident. But from a Marxist perspective, what is the relationship between counter-revolution and war? Slide, please. On one hand, we can take Gramsci's concepts of war of maneuver and war of position, combine them with his idea of passive revolution to help us develop a sense of counter-revolution as an elite-led cross-class movement through which capital finds new avenues for expansion at the same time as new terms for political debate are consolidated. On the other hand, we can take Carl Schmitt's notion of preventive counter-revolution as a war waged against both an internal class enemy and an external national enemy. The question I take up combines Gramscian and Schmittian perspectives to demonstrate the relevance of a cross-class movement that reorganizes the structures of governance in the matrix of elite politics at the same time as it creates an internal class enemy represented by those espousing revolutionary demands. This follows 
Silvio Federici's argument that capitalism is always regressive and counter-revolutionary. Counter-revolution, in other words, remakes the timeline. It bridges the polarization between classes by bringing elite and popular groups into political, economic, and cultural alliances, and in so doing, negates an anti-capitalist revolutionary future. Slide, please. I will examine the history of Mexico after independence to highlight three broad moments in which counter-revolution became central in shaping politics. Of particular relevance is how in the present, the memory of these moments is mobilized to justify militarization, paramilitarization, and neoliberalization in the guise of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador's so-called leftist government. Slide, please. So Mexico became a nation through a Creole counter-revolution. After, Napo oh, After Napoleon's invasion of the Iberian Peninsula in 1808 created a crisis of monarchical rule in Spain that translated to a crisis of colonial rule in the Americas, Creoles, individuals of Spanish descent born in the Americas, seized the opportunity to take power away from peninsulares, colonial officials born in Spain. Creoles rebelled against both Spanish rule and against grassroots revolutionary movements. The 1810 War of Independence started as a war waged by mestizo, indigenous, and poor groups against Bourbon colonial officials. But soon after, a well-trained Creole-led royalist army first defeated these revolutionary groups and then pivoted to cut ties with metropolitan authorities. In this new conjuncture, Creoles put themselves at the top of a political and economic system that starkly resembled the colonial system they had fought to overthrow. In the period of independence after 1821, Creole counter-revolutionaries established a new form of elite political debate contained in the liberal and conservative divide. Slide, please. Excluded from the liberal conservative split was a real struggle over the economic and social structures of the new nations. Both liberals and conservatives were concerned with how to develop a state bureaucracy that could gather revenues, impose a uniform legal system, and assert its dictates through force. Perhaps the best example is Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, arguably the most powerful politician of the mid 1800s, who was in both liberal and conservative camps at different moments. Debates over centralism and federalism consumed centers of power as war was, a, was waged outward against indigenous groups in the borderlands fighting for autonomy or inclusion, against Texan rebels, and against Spanish efforts to reconquer Mexico. In the decades following independence, these wars enabled a suppression of popular demands and an alienation of subaltern groups from participating in political debate. Slide, please. When tensions between conservatives and liberals could not be resolved through political debate, <laughs> war broke out. The 1858 War of Reform mediated the irresolvable conflict on the issue of land. In the end, liberals' vision of individual property, ownership, the separation of church and state, and individual legal personhood prevailed. The war produced leaders and officers for a generation to come, men like Benito Juarez and Porfirio Diaz. Slide, please. At the same time as a war of reform, the state engaged in other wars. In the Yucatan Peninsula, a coalition of conservatives and liberals waged a caste war against Maya peasants. This war sought to institutionalize racial labor hierarchies. In the North, Yaqui groups continued a long war against the Mexican military after state officials attempted to tax and allot their native land. The war against Yaqui communities, alongside other frontier wars against Apache, Comanche and other indigenous groups brought until then peripheral resources, labor, 
land, and raw materials into the fold of the state. These wars were substantially funded by the sale of church and indigenous properties. Selling land allowed the state to displace individuals, particularly indigenous and peasant groups, at the same time as it facilitated land concentration for market-oriented production. Displaced Yaqui, Maya, peasant, and other laborers were forced to work for wages, rations, or to pay debt. Buttressing this shift was a state willing to use force to discipline and modernize workers. Here were the seeds of a counter-revolutionary impulse founded on liberating labor from land. Slide, please. I think, yeah. In other words, wars were central for the transition to liberal governance, just as the transition to liberal land ownership was central to war waging. The culmination of liberalism and its turn into a counter-revolutionary process came with the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, a veteran of the war of reform and a venerated liberal. Diaz's brand combined technocratic governance, rural policing, railroad expansion, land concentration through dispossession, and discourses of white European racial superiority to apply a revamped project of modernity in Mexico. In opposition, landless peasants and community leaders, seasonal and indentured workers, industrial workers, and their poor working, working conditions, along with an increasingly frustrated political class unable to challenge the power of Diaz, formed the alliance for oppositional alliance that would turn into the Mexican revolution. A slide, please. I think one more, yeah. So the achievements of the 1910 Mexican Revolution meant that counter-revolutionaries had to contend with a much richer and institutionalized revolutionary legacy. Slide, please. At the end of the 1960s, student unrest and demands for democratization exposed the flaws of one party rule in the nation's center of power. In the state of Guerrero, clashes between guerrillas and the Mexican military revealed that the Mexican Cold War was a dirty war, since the state directed an undeclared military campaign against leftist guerrillas. Slide, please. To counterbalance repression, officials contracted high levels of debt for infrastructure projects industrial ventures, and social spending programs. But an urban and rural growing opposition calling, calling for democratic representation, expanded education, and land redistribution, the afterlives of revolution, failed to receive, receive benefits from debt accumulation. When Mexico defaulted on its debt in 1982, a burgeoning technocratic elite declared its allegiance to IMF structural adjustments, and in so doing, found allies in government institutions. Slide, please. The 1988 presidential elections, in, sorry, in the 1988 presidential elections, technocrats found their pride and joy in Carlos Salinas de Gortari. Representing a new class of politicians trained abroad, Salinas went to Harvard Kennedy School, where he refined his sleazeballing he seized the ropes of a new counter-revolutionary moment and rode away. Backed by business executives, he implemented structural reforms that liberalized Mexico's assets at an accelerated pace. It was all leading to a grand counter-revolutionary blow, gutting Article 27 of the 1917 Mexican Constitution, effectively ending land redistribution and allowing the privatization of collectively owned property. With this appeal, Salinas reconsolidated a counter-revolutionary right that looked to break away from the shackles of public spending, state-owned industries, strong organized labor, and collective land ownership. In its place came the North American Free Trade Agreement, a neoliberalization of labor, land, and property a century after the first liberal counter-revolution. Slide, please. Mm 
While the Mexican army violently repressed groups like the Zapatista Army for National Liberation, which specifically took up arms in 1994 against the passage of NAFTA, the neoliberal counter-revolution managed to forge a new governing consensus prioritizing foreign investment, free trade, legal protections for multinationals, and privatization of the public sector. A freedom of movement for capital that was matched by increasing policing of migrants and the militarization of borders. Slide, please. When this consensus showed signs of weakness, for example, teacher strikes and protests against austerity measures were met with police and military repression in the early 2000s, the drug war provided cover. Tying together a project of militarization, economic liberalization, increased incarceration and policing with a liberal Catholic anti-narcotics culture that blamed victims of state and paramilitary violence for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So the drug user and the drug smuggler became the purported targets of this war. The drug war reformulated counter-revolution. From its launch in 2006, the drug war displaced people from land through military and paramilitary violence, provided a legal system that streamlined processing of criminals, provided strong guarantees to corporations on their investments, and increased the precarity of labor by using state and paramilitary threats to force workers into poor working conditions and or dangerous migration routes. The tremendous rate of militarization unsurprisingly matches an exacerbation of violence across and beyond national territory. Slide, please. Today, this process of militarized development continues. As Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in the center of the, the picture, um, going against uh, campaign promises to take the military off the streets, has he has increased the power of the armed forces, namely through the creation of the National Guard in 2019 and its involvement in tasks ranging from everyday policing to the application of anti-migrant dictates. It would be a stretch to say that Lopez Obrador is part of an elite backlash, but it is, clearly, it is clear that the neoliberal counter-revolution and its emphasis on militarized security, particularly after the drug war, created the common sense on which Lopez Obrador operates. And that common sense is a counter-revolutionary one. Slide, please. So there are no inherent politics in an abstracted concept of war. Yet by taking the history of counter-revolution in Mexico as an example, the politics of wars and armed conflicts begin to come through. At different moments, under different circumstances, individuals and groups made decisions that shaped revolution, counter-revolutionary backlash. Many times, these decisions were made to maintain a perceived social order at the same time as they created enemies of the counter-revolution. Thinking about counter-revolution using Gramsci's notion of passive revolution alongside Schmidt's ideas of preventive, preventive counter-revolution demonstrate that that backlash against the revolution is not just negative, not just a negation of revolution, but a lively process of positing and substantiating ideas and practices of power and governance at the same time as it is a process of cultural reformulation where notions of belonging and unbelonging play central roles. To conclude, I am gesturing that it may be generative to understand war as a containment of the revolution and counter-revolution dialectic, which inserts politics right at the center of the concept and provides a way to analyze armed conflicts in their many forms as contestations over understandings of power, belonging, land, property, and more. And next, Saloni will talk about the evolution of culture wars and how we can analyze the aims of these wars in the present. Thank you. Hi, everyone. 
Um, thank you all for being here. Culture war is a slippery designation. At once capacious, isn't so much conquest and colonialism rooted in war over culture, as we've heard time and time again over these presentations, and specific. Like a civil war or a cold war, the designation of culture war implies a different sort of conflict than simply an unmodified war. In this portion of our presentation, the culture war functions as a metonym for power struggle over the meaning of gender, sex, the family, and the body within American society. We might locate one of its more legible origin points in the ascendance of the new right within American politics in the 1970s and 80s, but its current form, informed by decades of neoliberal policy and the rise of a uniquely American fascism, is what I'm principally interested in. White supremacy, to be sure, also structures this culture war and inflects each of its battles. Skirmishes, therefore, erupt frequently across the terrain of immigration policy, anti-racist education, and affirmative action. Slide, please. I'll begin with some scenes from our present day culture war and then take us through what I'm calling two different epistemologies of it. One rooted in consensus history and the other in a longer socialist feminist tradition. I'll conclude with a series of questions or you could say provocations about ways forward and how we might combine um, some of these theoretical insights. Slide, please. One of the places where the culture war is certainly underway is in the arena of formal politics. Like any war, this one is punctuated by moments of sea change. For example, in June of 2022, the American Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade, undoing 50 years of limited but nonetheless existent constitutional protection for abortion care. The decision set in motion a wave of ordinances resulting in not just forced pregnancy, but other forms of bodily immiseration, preventable death, prolonged or intensified pain, and pervasive anxiety about criminal prosecution. The culture war's political front has also been marked by an intensification of policing around gender expression and same-sex intimacy. In 2023 alone, 47 state legislatures have proposed some 492 bills restricting the rights of transgender people, trying to obtain gender-affirming health care, persecuting parents who seek care on behalf of their trans children, and barring books and curriculum in general referencing homosexuality, or in some cases, sexuality at all. The more legibly violent consequences of both of these arenas are the subject of media attention when they bubble up. Armed militias, disrupting drag queen story hours around the country at public libraries, or young men who identify with a community of incels unleashing their wrath upon the women they hold responsible for their sexual frustration, isolation, and loneliness. In the years since it was first named as such, America's culture war has become an armed conflict. Like the quotidian daily violence of other presentations have discussed already in civil and Cold War contexts, the battlefields of the culture war are often housed within the intimate spaces of personal cell phones and laptops, facilitated by social networking sites like YouTube and TikTok, where media personalities or thought leaders espouse a brand of gender evangelist ideology that are controversial and lucrative. Slide, please. And for a little taste of this, I've included some um, red pill memes here. I won't dwell on them for too long, but this is some of the kind of comedic valence that the culture war gets played out in on the internet. Uh, next slide, please. Though each of these actors justify their authority to diagnose the symptoms of a declining society in different traditions, their success is rooted in preaching a gospel of grievance that makes great import of the gulf between a natural order and a socially constructed concept like gender equality or reproductive autonomy. Widely understood as offering a new way forward for the boys and men who have been economically displaced by deindustrialization or globalization, these thinkers affect a rhetorical posture of brutal realism in making their points. Some celebrities of this men's rights universe I'm talking about are Jordan Peterson, Alex Jones, Andrew Tate, just to name a few. And they spend a great deal of their time evoking notions of binary gender and insisting that masculine and feminine traits are biological certainties under misguided assault from feminist boogeymen. And they're also conveniently anti-racist and Marxist boogeymen waiting in the wings within this cosmology as well. Their musings are not idle, but aimed at coercing consent and demonizing difference in explicitly political ways. For example, Peterson insists that patriarchy is the outgrowth of a natural competence that men have for leadership. 
and go so far as to suggest the utility of a program of state-sanctioned sexual redistribution, wherein women would be compelled to enforce monogamy by the state. Alex Jones claims that lesbians are predisposed to violence against their partners and often engage in cannibalism and that gay people are sexual sadists who practice violence and torture, um, all but legitimating violence against those communities. Andrew Tate openly advocates for physical abuse as a means of controlling the underage women he encourages his listeners to seduce. If these soldiers are waging an ideological campaign for the revivification of a very particular masculinity, they are accompanied by a cottage industry of content creation across the internet that peddles the equivalent hearts and minds campaign, presenting a vision of idealized female domesticity, monetizing the apparently viral appeal of normative gender performance through everything from Mormon mommy blogs to police wife influencing. Two different types of violence are leveraged here, a double valence that once again places the culture war rhetorically against the civil war or the covert war or the cold war. The first is an everyday threat of violence, violence that is domestic and intimate. It lurks behind patriarchal authority, brandished when those who embrace their gendered roles dare to question the so-called natural hierarchy of white male supremacy and control. The other is a more dramatic violence directed at those who represent the most brazen threats to that schemata, trans people, lesbians, and feminists. Both rely on the naturalization of biological gender categories that is not just the provenance of the ideological right. There are also some at the political center or even center left who accept the same table stakes when diagnosing the social malaise that seems to have accompanied transformations in the neoliberal economy. Slide, please. Take, for example, economist and Brookings Institution researcher Richard Reeves' recent book of Men and Boys. Uh, if you're an NPR listener, you've almost surely heard tell of it. Uh, writing in a genre that might be best described as popular economics, Reeves sets off to investigate a series of statistics about a growing gap in the metrics of economic and social power between the genders. Often he uses statistical analysis to do the work of constructing biological essentialism. Boys and girls are simply, in his analysis, developmentally different. To reference just one example, boys are, for example, good at standardized testing, um, and that is a marker of their cognitive prowess whereas girls are better at, quote, turning in their homework on time, an example of their prefrontal cortex development earlier in life. While this analysis is often accompanied by Reeves' marked inattention to history and culture, one of his recommendations for addressing these dynamics comes tantalizingly close to actually understanding the division of gendered labor. His research shows that men are significantly underrepresented in the high growth service industries that much of the American working class is employed within, heal professions, health, education, administration, and literacy. Reeves posits encouraging boys into work as teachers, nurses, and school administrators in order to improve their circumstances, offering little space to the ways that these industries are marked by systematic exploitation, overwork, and devaluation, a state of affairs enabled precisely by the tacit economic and cultural belief that the work of caring is gendered. As I began to puzzle through how Reeves' biological construction of gender and simplistic gloss of how labor is translated into the economy might be linked, I found myself returning to the idea of an epistemology um, of the culture war. Reeves's was an interpretation of the battlefield that set aside social processes in favor of data-driven technocratic policy. It's a method that considers the economic in only the most superficial of terms, and thus, it's left with solutions that don't meaningfully interrogate the interconnectedness of sex, status, and work in these battles. Next slide, please. There are, of course, other ways of interpreting the culture war as well, and I'd like to explore three of them very briefly here. The first is the epistemology of consensus history, uh, one that understands the culture wars as ancillary or merely symptomatic of broader economic trends within neoliberalism. And neoliberalism does indeed allow historians uh, valuable analytic to explore the gendered economy under flux, the social tensions created by an acceleration and intensification of income stratification, the triumph of a language of self-management and market efficiency in nearly every aspect of everyday life. However, it seemingly remains tempting for historians to marginalize the essential questions of gender and sexuality within this analytic of material of the material politics of neoliberalism. Slide, please. 
Take, for example, Gary Gersel's recent monograph, Tackling the Neoliberal Order. For Gersel, the culture war is useful insofar only as it helps to explain the cosmetic differences between the center left and the far right. De Gloss's analysis, liberals and conservatives of the era shared an economic agenda and debates about sex, culture and gender merely served to differentiate them to voters. It is an argument that rehearses an updated consensus history and one notably forged by the narrowing of the range of political actors to the likes of Bill Clinton on the left and Newt Gingrich to the right. Um, next slide. The analysis is one that we might be able to explain with uh, a leftist meme to match those red pill memes either, right? The culture war is simply a distraction, um, keeping us from actually contemplating the uh, real class war. Um, next slide, please. In reality, however, the political ground that the first battles of the culture war were first fought on bore witness to the rise of another epistemology that I would like to devote a little more time to. Historian Linda Gordon and her partner Alan Hunter diagnosed anti-feminism as, as a central propulsive agent of a, quote, strong and growing new right in a 1978 issue of Radical America. Rather than understand the new right's resurgence as mere backlash against the liberation movements of the 1960s, Gordon and Hunter argue that its rise was in fact a, quote, reassertion of patriarchal forms of family structure, unquote, that functioned as a direct challenge to class conscious politics. Appealing to left thinkers who had dismissed the import of gender and sex questions to the broader agenda, Gordon and Hunter argued that the economic and cultural politics of the new right had suffused a movement previously defined by stuffy institutions like the John Birch Society with a dynamism precisely because it acted as a movement in support of patriarchy. The proletarianized fathers who lost their power to pass on property and skills to their sons at the very moment that working class women gained a sense of economic independence were compelled by the new rights argument and the way that they had managed to seize upon women's independence as the cause of um, men's loneliness, rootlessness, and a disintegration of social order. Patriarchy, they, they argued, offered those men the stability that a transition towards a service-based economy had begun to erode. The material consequences of these politics were manifest in the anti-abortion, anti-gay, anti-welfare, anti-youth, and racist politics that were successfully cleaving a distinction between the deserving and undeserving poor, excluding the unemployed, the underemployed, single mothers, and the marginal in general from the working class, and precluding a genuine social movement that would um, revise the social order at the time. Slide, please. Much of Hunter and Gordon's core thesis, built on work by Maria de la Costa and Selma James, whose writing had placed women's socially reproductive labor at the center of a story of capital accumulation, denaturalizing it in the process. De la Costa and James's work opened the way for feminists to reinterpret class struggle from their own viewpoint. One work that sprung forth from this was, of course, Silvia Federici and Leopoldina, Leopoldina Fortunati's Pathbreaking Il Grande Calabano, first published in 1984. Writing about the transition from feudalism to market capitalism, Federici and Fortunati demonstrate how women's social status had been subjugated in an early process of primitive accumulation during that translation. Masculinity and femininity, they showed in their analysis, were contingent rather than natural or inborn, created, quote, in service of a project of domination that can sustain itself only by dividing on a continuously renewed basis those it intends to rule. Slide, please. One of the most important contributions of this work to the epistemological accounting, to this epistemological accounting, is its attention to the role of violence in constituting these categories. At times, there's certainly an undeniable rhyme between the medieval transition between feudalism to the market economy that Federici lays out and the realities of American politics in the era of COVID-19. Take, for example, the counter-revolution that 15th century landlords waged in response to the widespread opposition of feudal authority in the wake of the Black Death. As fewer workers demanded power from their overlords, political authorities appealed to young, rebellious male workers by means of, in Federici's words, a, quote, vicious sexual politics that gave them access to free sex and turned class antagonism into an antagonism against proletarian women by sanctioning practices like gang rape, sex trafficking, and the institutionalization by the state of prostitution. It's not all that far off from the program recommended by Peterson. 
Of the many scenes chronicled by Fortunati and Federici, the brutal persecution of witches during the 15th and 16th century emerges the most useful analog for the overlapping violent persecution of transgender people and the dramatic restriction of reproductive choice underway in the contemporary moment. Accused witches occupied many different roles. They were often midwives or otherwise possessed an expertise about controlling and managing reproduction. They were sometimes women who uh, engaged in sex outside of marriage for money, pleasure, or both. They were sometimes merely women who posed a threat to the interests of the ruling class. What they consistently shared was their poverty or social location that rendered them particularly vulnerable to the public violence of the witch hunt. It was that violence that was intended to warn others about the dangers of stepping beyond the bounds of acceptable femininity and exercising bodily autonomy in defiance of capital's interests. And like the podcast tirades of the men's rights movement, witch hunters made use of a multimedia propaganda campaign in order to paint these alleged witches as dangerous to children, male virility and public safety and order. Slide please. Um, and you can see some of that multimedia campaign. In Federici's words, the witch hunt, quote, destroyed a universe of practices, beliefs, and social subjects whose existence was incompatible with capitalist work discipline. The witch hunts were not, therefore, the, quote, last spark of a dying feudal world of the Middle Ages. They were the instantiating events of modern capitalism. Slide, please. I'd like to trace the consequences of bringing Federici's intervention to bear on one of the most intractable conflicts currently live within the feminist movement. Placing the assault on reproductive choice and trans existence underway in conversation with one another and arguing that they in fact affect a shared class of people whose bodily autonomy is being challenged in service of a social, political, and economic system that is not yet fully legible to us. Within feminist circles, the potential for, for solidarity between these two struggles is most often foreclosed by debates around the proper interpretation of new sites of reproductive and bodily self-determination, including medicalized uh, transition or surrogacy. One way of indexing these struggles very briefly and clumsily might be to describe them as a factional struggle between the cyborg and the witch, wherein the role of technology is pitted against that of an older order of physically embodied knowledge. Bringing in Federici's own earlier intervention around the subject of violence troubles the basis of this conflict, however. The culture war, like the Cold War, is not a bloodless conflict. It is a conflict that is being fought on live bodies, those of pregnant people, of trans children, and those with non-conforming gender presentations. The realities of this violence tells us something about how this conflict is, in the words of trans historian Beans Veloci, not about science or about sex, but about power. The violence offers us, as scholars, a clue about how power is being reconstituted and accumulated in this moment in service of a future we might not yet be able to see. Slide, please. Historical actors rarely have the critical distance to understand themselves in relation to change over time within their own historical moment. In analogizing the Middle Ages to our present day, I have surely uh, committed some form of dire historical malpractice. Um, but as Jesse explored last week, history need not repeat itself in order to rhyme. I do not know what epoch our current historical moment might be instantiating, but as this is my last presentation with this beloved and interdisciplinary group, I would like to make a provocative case for a different historical epistemology of the culture war than the one I outlined above. In the face of the rise of what might be a new fascism, the import of queer history seems to be particularly urgent to me. At our best, historians show how culture, society, and politics have changed over time without the sentimentality of teleological progress. Our work is to show how the so-called natural became so. When we do it carefully, we create the conditions wherein a rigorous accounting of the past might make a different future possible. To put more simply, it is more difficult to gesture seamlessly to a halcyon past filled with visions of beatific suburban housewives and clean-cut provider patriarchs when faced with evidence of the ways that gender and sex categories have always been unstable, shifting, and actively contested as far back as we can see. Thank you for listening to our reflections on our common question. Our several ways of thinking about the fallout of war in a dialectic which moves between the whole and the part.
We remind you uh, that these were actually, this was the second half of two presentations, and I believe you'll be able to find the first one online later. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. And we invite any questions that you may have about any of the parts of this project or the project as a whole. And to join the conversation, just uh, use your uh, Zoom icon to raise your hand or type the word stack in the chat panel and uh, we'll, we'll call on you in turn. Or we're, I think, a small enough group, you may just uh, speak up if you have something to uh, contribute or, or a question to ask. Sylvia, please go ahead. Thank you all so much for these incredible presentations. It's such a joy to listen. Um, and I have kind of just an impossibly huge unanswerable question, so I'll just put it out there. But I guess I'm curious, like through your topic on the metonyms of militarism, um, you know, what, where you land in terms of what you see or if you see a useful anti-war politics and how you see that articulated in your different sites. Um, yeah, I'd just love to hear some reflections on that. Um, I, oh, Michael. No, go. No, please go ahead. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh. I don't really have an answer to that, except to say um, it's kind of an intriguing way to think about this. I ended up in a lot of this in the first place because of anti-war politics that uh, coming out of the of being uh, exposed to the draft for the Vietnam War, uh, the first organization that I really got involved with was the War Resisters League. I discovered only recently that Michael Larner, who originally invited us to join in the Marxist Education Project, had himself started out as a, a printer for Win Magazine of the War Resisters League. And so uh, for me, uh, and this is why it's not really an answer, but kind of what drew me into all of these different presentations was a kind of rethinking of how one might imagine war and the different kinds of anti-war politics that somehow the kind of anti-war politics that emerged in the 70s around the Vietnam War don't seem to be, it's not that they're irrelevant, but they seem to have changed in this moment of endless war. Um, and so that I think is was for me one of the reasons to pursue the kind of thinking about the fallout of war. I don't know if that, maybe that other people can add to what that does, but Um, I was just going to speak briefly to the kinds of conversations we had as a working group around the keyword of war, where um, part of the working group process is that during the first semester, we each select readings around the keyword in combination with like a theme. So war and memory or war and counter revolution. Um, and one of the readings that we did um, uh, or I think that I was really influential for my project was this book by Alina J. Kim, who's an anthropologist who works on the Korean demilitarized zone, like the DMZ. And it's an interesting book because in as much as she's concerned with the ongoing war and how it registers in the environment of the DMZ, she's also very interested in this notion of peace um, as a kind of flip side to war. And in the book, she talks so much about how peace feels so under theorized or for some reason like so much more difficult to talk about or think about than war in some ways and really digs into why that is um so peace is a keyword that at least in my work shows up quite a bit because i work in on a 
territory and a geography that is still technically at war. And I think peace gets mobilized both in a metaphorical sense, but also a very uh, literal sense. And in the sites that I work in, which are sites of like militarized tourism, peace becomes something that's like inscribed into the environment. Um, So for example, like the greenwashing of the Han River is often advertised um, as a move towards peace by reconciling uh, the industrial damage um, of the 1970s and 80s that was done to the city um, through development projects as uh, being sort of um, redressed by the the greenification um, of the city and the turn to migratory bird um, conservation and and tourism and things like that. So I think that's a very different vision of peace, right? Like a state-sponsored vision of peace that is very different from what anti-militarist activists, um, which is also different, I guess, from anti-war in a way, um, but anti-militarism activists would say, you know, um, peace might actually look like the redressing of environmental toxification by the U.S. military um, in these in these spaces. So, yeah, I, that's all to say. I think that's a really interesting question, and I'm curious to hear what other people have to say about it. It sounds like it could be next year's keyword for you folks, uh, because I mean, all the different ways in which peace is uh, mobilized to construct, uh, uh, you know, hegemonic ideology. So, you know, the, uh, we have the Department of Defense, we have peacekeeping forces, we have, uh, uh, you know, peace is, uh, you know, is an ideological uh, keyword for, uh, uh, you know, mitigating actual anti-war uh, sentiment and uh, activity. So I think it's a, it would be a fruitful exploration. I was just going to add to, I think, in regards to thinking about the anti-war activism that was coming out of the, out of Michael's own (laughs) involvement with anti-war activism, as well as anti-nuclear activism, something that that was also happening in um, kind of convergently. There's this really interesting rhetoric that gets deployed about nuclear tests as being preventative of war. Um, And so I wrestled with, in part, um, with this keyword, wondering what naming, naming those nuclear tests as acts of war did. Was it like naming the violence of, um, was it naming, you know, this kind of like long durée of forever war or uh, was it marking the kind of terror formation of militarism in the Pacific as a kind of ongoing war. Um, And I still don't have a full answer to if if war is the sort of right category to be thinking. And I feel like I often then use militarism or militarization instead. Um, But I also feel like war has allowed at least me to think about wars as having kind of continuity across the nuclear age. So thinking about like World War II and the Cold War and um, the long war on terror as being, uh, as having direct impacts on people who were displaced because of nuclear weapons testing as acts of war. Um, And so a politics of peace or a politics of anti-war actually needs to address all of the historical presence that we're uh, dealing with as alongside these processes of militarization and colonialism. So maybe like sort of the like er theory of, of anti-war is like, I think um, it, that it require, we require like a real specificity of place um, mm-hmm. in the kind of anti-war work we're doing. And I know Michael in his presentation last week was thinking about that there is no universal theory of war, but there is like, an attempt to theorize capitalist war and I would even think a step further and like what does it mean to like theorize capitalist war from the site of these like particularly colonized spaces that continue to be militarily occupied um, where they're part of this kind of like logic of capitalist warfare but they're also amidst their own kind of um yeah, sort of palimpsests or what I call contingencies of the wars past and the wars that will never come or that because we're afraid they will come, 
the militarization continues. Um, Go ahead. I'm thinking of a, a way to formulate this question. Uh, I guess, did, did you, in your conversations and preparations of, of presentations, think about the, uh, the other side, uh, the, the you know, revolutionary war, uh, war, uh, just war, is that a notion of, that's valid? Uh, Wars that are waged uh, in response to counter-revolutionary wars. Uh, it seems to me that uh, most of your presentations have dealt with the uh, the oppressive uh, capitalist hegemonic side of uh, of this whole question. So I'm just curious to know if you're if any more consideration was given to. Uh, you know, to wars of resistance, wars of revolution, that sort of thing. Wars of liberation. Um, I go, no, sorry, Salon, you do want to? No, no, Mar, you go. Um, no, I mean, I do, I do think that uh, we, we did give a lot of thought and had a lot of conversations about it. And I think in some ways, a lot of us, as this conversation has already made clear, we're very interested in, in these sort of perhaps interstitial categories, right? Um, struggle, revolution, uh, conflict uh, that coexist and sometimes are synonymous with or sometimes not um, with with war or where war sometimes seems perhaps like, you know, the sort of master category uh, within which some of these all sort of potentially in, in a negative way, you know, sort of collapse into. Um, and I was very interested uh, in my work on, on Palestine and Palestinian literature in, 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 in dealing with, with a question that I think preoccupies uh, a lot of us in the field, which is what do you do with a revolution, right, that did not amount to the creation of a state, that did not culminate in a state form that then, you know, betrayed or disappointed um, by becoming authoritarian, et cetera, et cetera, which is, which is the trajectory of so many um, Arab states, obviously, during this period and so many other sort of global south uh, geographies. And, and, and the question of, of what the success is, right, or dissolution, the point of dissolution in, in a context like that of, of Palestine um, becomes very fraught because of its ongoing occupation, because of the fact that, as we were just discussing, um, the, the, the existence of a militarized settler state means that, you know, today, literally today, um, Israel is bombing Gaza, but we don't consider that to be an act of war. Uh, what, how do we render sensible and sort of make thinkable such an atrocious act? And what sort of lexicons and vocabularies do we draw on? And in terms of poetics, which is my concern as a literary scholar, you know, how do these um, different cycles, right, um, influence meditations on uh, the relationship between language and form and, and past and presence and, and reality, um, especially when there is an ongoing political program to liberate Palestine. Uh, so the question of, of liberation and resistance, I think, is, is, is for, for many of us very tied up to also uh, what, what we could consider to be our, our anti-war politics, if, if, we've, if we've elaborated or articulated um, any um, any sort of coherent theses around it, which I think we're beginning to perhaps, um, liberation is, is something that we all are very preoccupied with. Thanks. I'll just add very briefly that interestingly, I think something that emerged from many of our conversations was a preoccupation that we all shared with sort of the quotidian effects of war or like everyday militarisms. And I think regardless of if a conflict is revolutionary or counter-counter-revolutionary or anti-capitalist, 
there is a quotidian element of suffering that pervades. And so I think we did often think about the the sort of like underlying cultural context that war occurs in and what it produces throughout all of our readings. Um, but that's almost a, a side point. But I think it is a side point that I'm not sure. And it's, I think over the years, we've never tried to come to a, an agreement of what we all stand on. And so we may have 10 different positions on, on a different kinds of anti-war. But I think right from the beginning, and one of the early essays that we read was the one that Javier showed, the uh, Bolivar one on Marxism and war, about what are the benefits and costs, that's a terrible way to put it, but of actually imagining social struggle through uh, a lens of war to think that actually the struggle over the working day is a civil war as Domenpre quoted Marx there or Gramsci's idea that that political struggles are a war of position or a war of um, maneuver and whether these are actually useful whether this really comes out of particular moments is is, is it because Gramsci is coming out of living through the First World War that he's drawn to these metaphors, or are these metaphors things that really uh, illuminate it? And I must say for myself, I don't know, but there's a part of me that, um, you know, the lines between the pacifist and anti-war tradition and the Marxist and socialist tradition have always both been kind of uh, intersecting, but also different in different ways. And uh, I, I'm, I have yet to make fully my piece. I remember, this will be my last thing on this, that one of the remarkable things in Engels's condition of the working class in England, one of the first things that he writes is that if workers are organized in a socialist way, it will make social struggles more pacific. That indeed, if there is not organization, struggles will be more violent, more warlike, and that actually organization and, and more kind of revolutionary in what he at that point saw as the bourgeois concept of revolution, people hitting each other and killing each other in the streets. And that he actually argues that the, the strength and perseverance in order to maintain a strike is actually a, 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 a deeper and richer form of solidarity than it is to walk out in the streets uh, and uh, engage in street fighting. And though at the end, Engels, had, who fought in many ways longer about war than I think than Marx did, was always struck to both his own youthful attraction to having been in the military and being interested in military strategy, but thinking that in somehow um, the social struggle would actually be able to transcend some of those militarist forms. I was thinking as you were talking that the uh, the experience of the First World War really colored and affected greatly the discourse of Marxists and politics in the in the formative period of the Communist International and and so on in the early 20s. So that and then that kind of persisted through really down through the 20th century and the and the the rhetoric and the discourse of uh, a lot of uh, Marxist politics. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that the more we got into this project, or I started thinking more about war, the the sort of uh, idea of war as armed conflict, whether high or low intensity, um, started becoming, you know, that started becoming less clear. Um, I think the sort of uh, Michael's presentation, the, the Clausewitz, uh, war is politics by other means. I think there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, alongside the Gramsci war metaphors, I think actually like, to, to, to also Sylvia's question, I think like 
for me have shifted um my headphones i think are dying but um shifted the the idea of like an anti-war politics to kind of what anshul was saying like an anti-militarist anti-militarism in in in, for, in any form and to the question of um sort of revolutionary struggle i think you know i think as i was uh as i was delving into 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 the project and this concept of counter revolution it became clear that one of the main things um that comes from start studying counter revolutions or revolutions is actually like that we need to even as hard as it may be based on what saloni was saying that we sometimes cannot locate ourselves until uh we are past our historical <laughs> moment um the sort of like a politics that are revolutionary that may not look like any other politics in the past i mean even the, if they might be sort of like taking parts um parts from that but i think like um understanding the 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 positive and negative aspects of both revolution and counter revolution actually i think for me gave gave a different meaning to like what a war in the political and the armed conflict sense means and in terms of like what we can do now it's like a, it feels like a really daunting thing to to think about what counter, counter what revolution looks like but i think um the 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 sort of like um yeah i don't know i think that's that's part of what was motivating uh, me and i think based on the also based on the conversations in this group if that made any sense Well, we're coming up on the two hour mark. I uh, don't want to cut anyone off if there's if there's any more conversation or discussion to be had. Uh, but uh, would, any, would anyone from the group like to wrap things up for us? Well, let me ask a quite let me ask another question. One of the things that occurred to me in Saloni's final talk was one of the famous definitions of the state or whatever is Weber's one of having the state being that which had the monopoly of the legitimate exercise of power, of force, and of violence. And in some sense, one could say that actually that the marriage contract was precisely that monopoly of the legitimate exercise of violence in the household and that it does say that the sense in that in Saloni's final talk today that in some sense that there is a kind of war and violence inside the household uh that is 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 behind that long account of the witch hunt right up to the present is i think i just wanted to to underline that because there's sometimes it feels like the discussion of war takes us back away from uh sexual war as one might call it that way and it did seem to me that one of the things that throughout this year that we've tried to do was to keep the kind of intersection between the forms of intimate violence and forms of non-intimate violence uh that might or might not be characterized as war so i that's meant to kind of if you want to say more uh push me on yeah i mean i completely agree and i also think i don't know i think a lot of our reading or thinking about war has been about like at its most abstract level about force and about coercion and about sort of where those things end up and i think that the war metaphor was actually rather helpful for me in seeing that those things are not just metaphorically connected but in fact there is a condition of force that exists both in the use of military authority rightful or unjustified you know or in the use of violence in order to like create a particular sexual or gender order and i think you almost have i mean we could i am sometimes guilty of an extended metaphor that goes on for too long but we were talking a lot about sort of like mercenaries and contracted soldiers versus warriors like all of these different distinctions in our talking and i think the sort of like 
figure of patriarchal authority, be that the husband or the foreman or the feudal leader is like, in some ways, the figure that is deputized to carry out a state program of violence in order to discipline certain kinds of labor. And so, and that's reproductive labor in its most obvious sense to me, but I think might be functioning in other ways. Um, and so what that like deputized actor empowered to carry out the violence in, I think that we, we have to look for it in different places if we are actually foregrounding gendered violence. And we look for it in places that, you know, don't illegalize marital rape or how, you know, laws are constructed. I think the state actually disperses its power to um, carry out a gendered program of violence that it perhaps does not in terms of like territorial or other kinds of um, war. Not to jump the gun, but thank you all for coming too. I mean, I don't mean to end us. I'm sweating. It's like very humid in New York. I'm not sure if <laughs> others are experiencing the same thing. Um, but I, this was a, a pleasure to get to this again on Zoom. Okay, uh, thank you again to the, the Yale Working Group on Globalization and Culture, to Michael and all your comrades, and we look forward to seeing you for further fruitful sessions next year. Uh, this is becoming an annual event, and we appreciate it. Uh, and for everyone who wants further Marxist education or Marxist adjacent education, uh, go to uh, www.marxedproject.org and check out all our programming. Thanks again. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, thank everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.